Hi, welcome to this video on hypothesis testing, power, type 1, and type 2 errors. In this video, I'm going to give you an intuition for these uh, concepts using a visual widget. Uh, but before I do that, I actually want to go over a couple of slides and cover some slightly more theoretical concepts. The concepts in this lecture would take place about halfway through an introductory probability and statistics course. So there's some prerequisites that I'm assuming you already have. You either already covered that chapter on hypothesis testing or you're about to. So you've probably, you should already understand a basic bell curve properties, uh, the symmetry of it, that there are certain proportions of probability under certain segments of the curve. You should know what a standard deviation is, what z-scores are. You should have covered the central limit theorem, and you should understand what a sampling distribution is. Also, you should have some intuition for what it means uh, for a variable to be normally distributed and random. So for instance, we have height here uh, in this image. Height is normally distributed for adult males at 5'10". So that means that most male, adult males are around 5'10". So if I was in my classroom on the first day of class and I hadn't met any of the students yet, and I was going to try to guess the height of the next male that came in through the door, my best guesses would be 5'10 or something near that. So yes, it's possible that the college's basketball team's center decided to take my class and he might be the next person that comes in and the guy's maybe like 6'6 or 6'7 or something like that. But that's not as likely to happen. And that height in, uh, in the distribution that's centered around 5'10 doesn't occur as much. To illustrate some of the main concepts of hypothesis testing, we can liken that to a guessing game. So this is just an analogy, but I think it'll serve to highlight some of the points that will help you understand the hypothesis testing framework. So let's say that I have two buckets, and in one bucket, I have one orange ball and eight white balls. And then I have an alternative bucket, and in this bucket, I have the opposite. I have eight orange balls and one uh, white ball. So. Uh, this game will consist of me putting one of those two buckets on the table and then you're going to have to just draw, like without looking in, just reach in and, and draw one of those uh, balls. So draw a sample, which will consist of one ball. And then you're going to have to guess what bucket is on the table. So one of the part of this game is that you do know the distribution that is inside each bucket, you just don't know which bucket is on the table. So you know that the probability of drawing an orange ball from the original bucket would be one out of nine. And of course, you know, this probability, uh, what that means is that in the long run, that's the amount of times that you would be getting pulling a, an orange ball, right? It doesn't mean that if you draw, if you take, you know, uh, if you draw nine times that one out of those nine times, it's going to come out an orange ball, right? It's just, it's a long run. Uh, on average, that's how many times that the orange ball comes out of this bucket. Um, so that's the game. You do know what the distribution uh, is within each bucket, and you're going to have to guess which bucket is on the table based on the sample that you took. So your best reasoning for this game is to reason as follows. If a ball has a higher probability of occurring in one of the buckets, then infer that it's coming from that bucket. So for instance, if you happen to draw an orange ball, your best guess would be to say that it came from the alternative bucket because that bucket is the one that more typically yields orange balls, right? So that's the reasoning that you're going to use. However, uh, there is one slight problem with this uh, reasoning. The problem is that both buckets 
yield both types of color for the balls. So if you go with this reasoning, some of the times you're actually going to be incorrect. The analysis of your probabilities of being correct or incorrect under each of these two bucket situations is really what the hypothesis framework is all about. Let's say that you've decided to use this best reasoning all the time, every time uh, we play this game and we play around and I end up putting the original bucket on the table. What is your probability of being correct and incorrect? Well, think about it this way. You're, every time you pull out an orange ball, you're going to wrongly guess the alternative bucket because you're using, uh, you decided to use that, that reasoning. So your probability of being incorrect when the original bucket is on the table is going to be equivalent to the probability of drawing an orange ball from that bucket, which is one out of nine. And the probability of being correct would be the complement of that, which is eight out of nine. This made up game is just an analogy, but it's a good idea to keep this kind of overall framework in mind as we continue to study hypothesis testing. The basic hypothesis testing framework is that we start off with a distribution we call the null hypothesis, symbolized as H uh, sub uh, zero. And that represents the status quo. It represents no change. So there is some kind of accepted number or metric that represents some kind of characteristic about the universe, like height or weight or something. And we assume that it is fixed, it is there, and there hasn't, no change has taken place. But we also have a distribution called the alternative hypothesis, symbolized as H sub one or H sub A. And this represents a researcher's belief that some change has taken place along that dimension that is being considered. So uh, it's, you know, there's been a positive change or a negative change. Something has changed. And researchers, what, what happens is they'll take a sample and they'll determine whether the sample has a low probability value specifically under the distribution of the null hypothesis, the, the distribution that represents no change. So if they come up with a sample that has a very low probability value, that is a value that doesn't typically happen under the null hypothesis, then they reject that, that it came from the null hypothesis and that it probably came from some other distribution. In other words, some change has taken place along that dimension. This table represents the possible ways that you could be correct or incorrect uh, given the, each condition, whether the null hypothesis is true or the alternative hypothesis is true. So for instance, if the null hypothesis is actually the truth, uh, basically remember that everything is in re relation to the null hypothesis. So if the null hypothesis is the truth and you don't reject the null hypothesis, that is to say you got a sample and you don't, and you don't reject that it came from the null hypothesis, you have made the correct decision. And that is the formula for that is one minus alpha. So if you, if the null hypothesis is the truth and you reject the null hypothesis, you take a sample and you go, oh, I don't think that this came from the null hypothesis, then you've made a, an error. This is called a type one error. Uh, this is also alpha. And this is also known as a false positive. You kind of jumped the gun. You thought that there was an effect or a change when in reality there wasn't. Um, and of course, these two values being correct and being in an error are complementary to each other. So if a type one error is alpha, then, and that's the probability of being wrong, then the probability of being correct is one minus alpha, right? The complement of that. Similarly, if the alternative hypothesis is the thing that's true, and uh, in this case, you should reject right? Because it's the alternative hypothesis. So you should reject that your sample came from the alternative or from the original, the null hypothesis. Uh, but if you don't reject, 
then you've committed a type 2 error and this is called beta. This is also known as a false negative and it's essentially failing to recognize that an effect did actually take place. So there was a change in the distribution and you just didn't recognize it. So this is beta or type 2 error. So now if the alternative hypothesis is a true hypothesis and you do reject the null hypothesis, then you've made the correct decision. This is known as power. It is a complement of the error, so it's 1 minus beta. Let me draw your attention to this curve on the left here. This represents the, the null hypothesis. So notice that the two tails on both ends are shaded red. So there are three types of hypothesis tests. There are two-tailed tests that look like this. There are right-tailed tests that look like that. There are left-tailed tests that look like that. So the most typical ones are the two-tailed tests. So here, what happens is when the researchers draw a sample, if their values are to the right, you know, of this line here, this cutoff line here that designates the beginning of the, the red shading, then they would reject that the null hypothesis. Similarly, if they found a value that was here more to the left of where the red shading is, then they would also reject the null hypothesis. So this shading right here, it, uh, it represents a, um, a certain proportion of shading underneath the curve, and that's the error, that's why it's in red, that's the alpha that was mentioned before. Uh, but as you can see here, right now I have it set for 2%. A typical error rate is 5%. So as I'm increasing it to 5, as you'll notice, the 5% gets distributed equally um, amongst the two tails. So there's 2.5% here on the right and there's 2.5% here on the left. Uh, if it's a right tail test, then all of the 5% goes to the right. If it's a left tail test, then all of the left uh, all of the 5% uh, goes to the left. Um, and also, like, obviously, uh, the rules are the same for right tails. So if you're, if you're looking at a right tail test, then you're looking for a value that's to the right of this shading. If you're looking at a left tail test, then you're, the researcher is trying to find a value that's to the left of this shading because that would enable them to reject the null hypothesis. Um, so those are that's a couple of things about uh, these sorts of tests. I kind of wanted you to get a, a visualization for that. Another typical um, percentage that researchers use is 1%. So notice here, uh, this rejection region has gotten smaller, which means that the researcher has made it more difficult for themselves to reject the null hypothesis. So this kind of... Uh, is reducing their error underneath the null hypothesis situation. Um, it means that they have to find more extreme, more rare values in order to be able to, to reject the null hypothesis. Let's reason through a few examples, but before we do that, let me show you this widget and how it works really quick so that um, as we go through the examples, you can kind of know what to look for. So here we have uh, the two distributions. We, these are sampling distributions based off of your data. This is a sampling distribution if the null hypothesis is true. And this one back here, this kind of faded one, is a sampling distribution if the alternative hypothesis is true. So you already saw how this is a kind of right tail, two tail thing, uh, left tail, right tail, two tail, whatever. You saw me move the uh, error rate underneath the null hypothesis. Um, you can all, uh, this widget also enables you to move uh, the distribution, the alternative distribution back and forth. Um, the standard error, which I'll show you in a little bit. And then down here, we have this table that I just went over, which is that standard table that describes this uh, situation. Also, I can toggle back and forth to show, to demonstrate uh, which is the truth. So when I toggle between these two, as you can see uh, on the uh, up here on the distributions, one of them becomes dotted and then the, the one that was kind of in the background becomes filled in. That's to kind of represent like, hey, this one's is the truth, right? Uh, like the null, in this case, like the null is the truth one and the alternative one kind of fades into the background. And on the bottom part here, 
the whatever is the truth not only comes to the forefront individual but it also lights up uh, here in this table that we observed um, in a couple slides ago so with that being said let's go ahead and start with some of these examples let's start with the example that we have a null hypothesis that says the average male height is 510 right that's what the accepted kind of truth or knowledge that we have is that's represented as mu equals 510 so mu means the population average when we take samples we're making inferences about population parameters so we're going to have an alternative hypothesis that represents some kind of change from the status quo so if you look at this first bullet point here we're going to look at the situation where a researcher believes that that it's different the researcher believes that the average height for males is greater than 510 so this is represented as mu greater than 510 and this would be a right tailed test so let's model that with our widget so we're looking at a right tailed test remember that there are two mutually exclusive possibilities either um, people are 510 still or the average male height is 510 and that would be centered here at zero where this null curve is or people have gotten taller than 510 right the, the the distribution has changed and the new average is somewhere that's taller right uh, over two standard errors more than than our starting point so let's examine and, and reason and think about uh, the null being true so uh, we have the null being true. We, we can look at the box here. So here, if the null hypothesis is true, the investigator is going to reject that, that their sample is coming from the null hypothesis. If they, if they get a sample of, of people and the average ends up being higher than this cutoff point here, right? So when the null hypothesis is true and the change hasn't taken place, these values uh, from this point and beyond only occur with 1% of probability. So that's why the error is 1%, right? That's the alpha level here that you can see it's uh, 0 0.01 uh, because that's the threshold that the researchers set. Um, they're, they're, they're kind of saying like, hey, if we find these like really low probability you know, values here, we're going to reject that it's coming from the null hypothesis. But they understand that they're going to be wrong 1% of the time when the truth is a null hypothesis. Um, and as you can see the box here, uh, the correct decision is 99%. So what would happen if the truth was the alternative hypothesis? Let's say that the researcher is correct and actually people have gotten a lot taller, right? So 510 is right here. And then over here we have like, I don't know, like maybe like 6'4 or something like that, right? So um, I'm not sure exactly what the standard uh, deviation is for, for male height, but let's just say that it's different, right? That, that males have gotten taller. So um, if we examine uh, the box down here, uh, we can see that the alternative hypothesis lit up. Uh, we have our error is 22% and our power is 78%. So notice that this power area this in blue is everything to the right of the cutoff which you can kind of see here uh, in the null hypothesis behind uh, so here it is again uh, so this is the cutoff area so the blue the power starts where the cutoff is so what that means is that in the situation that the average height has actually changed then this is the real distribution right like it really is centered over here somewhere and uh Basically, it means that if a researcher takes a sample of people and gets their average, they're more likely to get, he's very likely to, or she is very likely to get this uh, center point here, right? Because that's the most probabilistic value of occurring. So if he did, if the researchers did get that value, then they would reject the null hypothesis, right? Because that those values are within to the right of the rejection region that, that is set underneath the null hypothesis. However, um, this distribution also will sometimes yield values that are of people that are really, really tall over here on the right end, or people that are shorter, right? 
And in this case, you can see that this distribution here reaches all the way back to the, uh, uh, the center of the null distribution. So even if people have gotten a lot taller, there's still going to be people that are 5'10", right? There's not going to be as many, but they're, they're still going to be there. So if a researcher takes a sample of people and gets a, an average, and they happen to get you know an average that's in this lower tail of this distribution, they're going to fail to recognize that a change actually took place, you know, because it's not within the rejection region. So um, that's what we call the beta error, right? That's a, the type two error, a false negative. A change did actually take place, but the researchers didn't recognize it because the sample that this the new real distribution yielded was one of the lower probabilities that was to the left of the researchers predetermined cutoff region. Let me mention a couple more things about power. So uh, you can look at the blue area here and that corresponds to this bottom uh, corner box uh, power. So um, this difference between these two peaks here is called the effect size. So as I move the alternative curve to the right, you can see that more of it turns blue and you can see in the bottom box on the right that I'm accumulating more power as well, All right? So power is a probability that you're going to be able to, to correctly reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false, right? So the alternative distribution is a true one, and you're going to be able to detect that uh, with your sample. So you can see that um, the further, the bigger the effect size, the more to the right that I go, the close, the more power that I accumulate. So what this would mean, it would be the equivalent of saying something like, hey, look, uh, people have gotten so much taller. You know, they're like, you know, like the average height is like 6'9 or something like that. So now imagine a, a bell-shaped distribution, a normal distribution where the average height is like, you know, something like 6'9, right? So even the shortest people within that distribution are going to be like, oh, like, like 6'2 or something like that. But any, sa any sample that you could get from this distribution is going to give you a mean that's clearly in the cutoff of, of this, uh, of your, uh, your alpha level, right? So this is just kind of an exaggeration to kind of show you the point of what power means, right? So when the effect size is really, really big, that basically is going to increase your power because more of the distribution is going to be in the rejection region. Um, let me move back here a little bit. So here's another thing that's important to mention about power and another thing that affects power, a couple of, another couple of things. So, um, the researchers predetermined error rate. So right now it's set at one. Another typical error is five, right? So I'm going to make this red shading, uh, cover more of the, the null hypothesis. And you'll see how moving this threshold back not only reduces the error under the null, under the alternative distribution, but it increases the power, right? So as I'm increasing the error, and you can even see that in these boxes here as a change, um, and I'll move it slowly so you can kind of follow along and you might have to rewind the, the video, but let me increase the power under the null hypothesis. So as you can see, I'm increasing the red under the null distribution, which is increasing the blue under the alternative distrib distribution while decreasing the error under the alternative distribution. See, as I'm increasing the error under the null distribution, it decreases the error under the alternative distribution. So those two errors, alpha and beta, are inversely proportional to each other. Researchers have to find the balance between trying to reduce their error under the null hypothesis situation and also trying to reduce their error under the alternative hypothesis situation. So that's another thing that affects power. So the researcher's predetermined alpha level will affect it as well as the, um, the effect size between these two distributions. The previous scenario it could be done as a left-tailed or a two-tailed test. So 
the researcher could have thought, oh, hey, look, I think the average height is less than 5'10 now, and that would be a left-tailed test. Or maybe the researcher doesn't really know in what direction it's gone. They just know or they just believe that it's different than 5'10. So in this case, the researcher will conduct a two-tailed test, and that would be the equivalent of saying that mu is not equal to 5'10. Let's take a look at this last example very quickly to uh, shed some more light on a couple of other things that affect power. So let's say that we have a null hypothesis that represents uh, no change, right? And here we have like a, uh, uh, an example of medicine. Let's say that uh, they, uh, researchers came up with some kind of new uh, drug that increases people's happiness levels. So the null hypothesis would be that the average happiness level in depressed patients has not changed after receiving this treatment. So the, the average, the mu after, is not different, is the same thing as the mu before. And then we, the researcher has an alternative hypothesis uh, where they believe that this medication does actually cause a change and uh, it causes a change in the positive direction. So the average happiness level in depressed patients has increased after treatment. Uh, so the mu after is greater than the mu before. So let's model this. Uh, again, this would be a, um, uh, a right tail test. So um, the, the researcher would choose whatever, you know, alpha cutoff level they would want. You know, if they wanted to be very stringent, they could choose like 1%, for instance. So let's say that for this scenario, the researchers, they actually know that this medication does actually produce an effect, right? Like they, they've they actually run tests on this medication before. So uh, they have previous research that shows that this these medications do actually make people happier. So let's say that they know that they can get an effect size that's maybe like, like this big, right? So um, they, they know that it produces a change. So they know that the alternative hypothesis is true, right? A change does actually come from taking these medications. So now look at this distribution. You could see that it's almost like 50% blue and 50% gold, right? So there's a lot of error here. So even though this is a truth, the researchers might take a sample and their mean from that sample might not be in the cutoff region, right? So the researchers, if they really kind of want to find, uh, uh, find a significant effect, they want their study to, to, to have that um, significant uh, effect uh, to show, they can, you know, maybe they, they can increase the error, right? So they can increase the error under the null hypothesis, especially if they know that a uh, that an effect really does take place, they can increase the error, which is going to make it easier for them to reject the null hypothesis. And as we saw earlier, increasing the error under the null increases the power under the alternative distribution. And as you saw, the alternative distribution became more blue as I pushed back this red um, shaded area. So we got some more power out of that, right? So uh, let me take you back uh, to the 1% so that you can see the changes here. Um, I'm going to put it back to 1. So here was a 1% error rate. So if they want to make it easier to reject, they can, they can up this error rate, right? So they're upping the error rate under the null hypothesis and they're gaining more power. They're making it more probabilistic that they're going to be able to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so here we are at 5%. So that's one way that the researchers might actually be able to increase power. Another way that they can increase power and be able to detect a true effect would be to reduce the standard error. So the standard error is the width of these distributions. And usually the way that they do that or the way that they do that is by increasing the sample size. So by increasing the sample size, they decrease the standard error and they make this distribution more narrow. Because that, that's saying that they become more sure of what that, that at samples mean, that samples average is. So as you can see here, as the error is, as the curve becomes more narrow, more of its area ends up being to the right of the cutoff value. So look at here, 
I'm increasing the error. The, the curb is getting more narrow. I'm sorry, I didn't sh wasn't showing this bottom box, but I'll, I'll go through it again. So I'm decreasing the error. I'm making it more narrow and more of the distribution is to the right of the cutoff. That's giving me more power. So I'll go backwards. So you can follow along down here and you can see that the power and the error are changing. So as a standard error, the width is increased. You can see that now less of it is to the cutoff. So that's another way in which researchers try to affect power. Oh, and lastly, I forgot to mention, another thing that can affect power just in general is whether it's a one-tailed or a two-tailed test. So for instance, I have it as a one-tailed test here, um, but as I turn it to the two-tailed test, since the, uh, the rejection regions get spread to both ends, we, we decreased the uh, red region here on the right. So but because we decreased it, we also decreased the power. So let me show you here again. I'll go from a two-tailed uh, to a one-tailed, and you'll see that the power changes. So here's the right tilt again. So power is at 85.4%. So let me go to two-tailed. And now power is at 77%. Okay, so that does it for this uh, lecture on power uh, hypothesis testing type 1 and type 2 errors. And I hope this gave you an intuition, both visually and just logically, for what these things mean. Um, good luck.